throwing around there, but uh, so Suresh and Irene, there is sound now, and Dale, there is sound. I had it muted on purpose, so uh, we were not starting quite yet, so, and I'll let people know now. So, yeah, the, the no sound for the people on the internet, the no sound in the first five minutes was intentional. That way we could kind of just let people in um, without sound. Uh, so we could speak freely about all of you who are watching on the internet, all of us who are here in person. Just kidding. One thing that uh, I didn't get a chance to do um, before we began is to take a picture which I have been doing right and posting those for you on Facebook. Um, I will have to do that at the end because I don't have time to do that right now as we begin. So we will uh, post all of that, which I don't know, maybe there's someone, well, no, they don't have the ability to post those things necessarily. Yeah. So... Sorry to stress you out, Dale. You'll be okay. Okay, so very good. Let's uh, begin even with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, as we dive even deeper into the basic moral principles of our Catholic faith, this church that you have given to us here on earth to guide us into all truth with the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds uh, to the truths that you desire for us to understand, to come to a greater understanding of, but also, Lord, to believe that we might recognize the word that you have given to us and open our hearts even to that word that we might be converted and know you more fully even as we seek to follow you and keeping your commandments that we also may not just know you more fully but love you more fully and also grow in that holiness of life and that freedom that you desire for each of us Let's, we're going to, before I close with prayer, also I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter verse or chapter 15. I'm getting ahead of myself already. You'd think I'd had coffee today, but I haven't. Um, cha chapter first, <laughs> chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. This is my commandment, love one another. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for, my friend, for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Again, Lord, help us to be numbered among your friends, among those elect even as we celebrate or pray the Mass in the Mass. Give us the strength that we need also, Lord, to follow your commandments, to keep them all the days of our lives. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Okay, uh, can people online let me know that we're still live with you because my phone actually cut out and that means that our it disconnected for a moment from the Wi-Fi. It looks like it's still connected to me on my phone now that I'm up again, but can you give me, someone make some kind of comment there online. There's a little bit of a delay, so we'll have to wait for a second for people to actually do that. Oh, I'm seeing a thumbs up, so maybe that's what they're telling me. Okay, very good. Good. So, good evening again, everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I think, yep, we have, okay, very good. Everybody looks like they're there with us. So, hello to everybody who's online also. There's a number of messages that are popping up. If you have questions, again, please, uh, you can stop me throughout um, and also ask questions online as well. So, anybody who has questions there, feel free. Uh, there may be many, especially tonight, um, as we dig into things a little bit more. We're going to start with a note. It's actually at the back of your handouts. Uh, so if you go to the back side, which is page four, turn back to page three, and it says at the bottom there, a note from the USCCB. So I, I want us to hear this message also from the USCCB before we even begin to plow through some of uh, these basic moral principles, because I think it's a message that's important for us to hear. I, I put it at the end in your notes, but I think it needs to be even bookmarked. It needs to be, uh, or bookmarked, it needs to be bookended. So it's at the beginning and also at the end. So listen to what the USCCB says in a letter that they put out. Our culture frequently exalts individual autonomy against community and tradition. This can lead to a suspicion of rules and norms that come from a tradition. This can also be a cause of healthy criticism of a legalism that can arise from concentrating on rules and norms. So important for us that we can't be overly focused on rules and norms, right? So there are people who can go overboard with that. Now, they'll, they'll speak to that in a moment. But so there's a healthy criticism, they say, in that sense of a legalism that can arise from concentrating too much on rules and norms. Advocates of Christian morality can sometimes lapse into a legalism that leads to an unproductive moralizing. There is no doubt that love has to be the essential foundation of the moral life. So, we have the law, but we also have love, right? Law of love, which we talked about last uh, week from the beginning, is the basis of everything. But that love also has a form, right? And that's what they're going to continue to say here. But just as essential to that law of love, right, in terms of the moral life, but just as essential in this earthly realm are rules and laws that show how love may be applied in real life. In heaven, love alone will suffice, because in heaven we will love perfectly, right? So in heaven we will love perfectly, but while we're here on the face of the earth, we still have sin which makes us imperfect, and so we, won't, we don't love perfectly in this life, which is why, again, it says we need then the commandments. In this world, they continue, we need moral guidance from the commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the precepts of the church. We spoke about all of those uh, last week. And other rules to see how love works. So, love is not, it's not just we say and we can overuse this, right? God is love and then we leave it at that. Yes, that's true, God is love, but how do we properly understand even what love is? So love is the guiding principle, it's the guiding force for us, but there are certain laws that are given to us, the commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, the precepts of the church and other rules so that we can understand and see how it is that love is meant to work. Love alone set adrift from moral direction can easily descend into sentimentality that puts us at the mercy of our feelings. That's precisely what's happened in our world today, right? 
everything is about how I feel about something, and we want everybody to feel good, and it, it's a guiding force of my feelings rather than using our reason, for one, and using what God has given to us, too, right, in the law, but also in terms of even how, again, to love. Popular entertainment romanticizes love and tends to omit the difficult demands of the moral order. In our permissive culture, love is sometimes so romanticized that it is separated from sacrifice. Because of this, tough moral choices cannot be faced. The absence of sacrificial love dooms the possibility of an authentic moral life. So they're saying moral choices can't be faced by so many people out in the world, right? They're, they're not willing to make those sacrifices and they don't have a moral compass that's guiding them in any way, shape, or form other than their feelings about something. And then, of course, the absence of sacrificial love dooms the possibility of an authentic moral life. So we can lead an authentically moral life if we open our hearts to the Lord and his love that he gives to us, but also the law of love that he has given to us in the scriptures. Scripturally and theologically, the Christian moral life begins with a loving relationship with God, a covenant love made possible by the sacrifice of Christ. The commandments and other moral rules are given to us always, as, sorry, given to us as ways of protecting the values that foster love of God and others. Again, an authentic love, right? They provide us with ways to express love, sometimes by forbidding whatever contradicts love. The moral life requires grace. The Catechism speaks of this in terms of life in Christ and the inner presence of the Holy Spirit, actively enlightening our moral compass and supplying the spiritual strength to do the right thing. The grace that comes to us from Christ in the Spirit is as essential as love and rules, and in fact makes love and keeping the rules possible. So that's, again, I even quote down there that it's taken directly from the Bishop's uh, Conference website, and I give you the, the website address there, right? So it's important for us, I think, to hear that message because it sets a foundation for us. If we're saying God is love and it has no rules and it just revolves around our feelings, well, that's the opposite of what... The, the bishops are saying, right? The authority of the church says also. But if we're just saying it's all about rules, 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 and not about love, then we're also uh, devolving, in a sense, into a, a kind of legalism, right? So uh, I have, and this is not to criticize these guys in any way, but I have a couple of priest friends that they know everything when it comes to the law, right? Maybe not everything, they're still learning. But if I ever have a question around canon law, I'm going to send them a message, right? Um, because, and I constantly have questions around canon law, and so I'm constantly sending them messages. It's not just canon law, but church law, even in general, liturgical laws and all kinds of things, because that's kind of the framework that keeps us sort of in the boundaries too, right? Where do, and then if we start roaming outside of those boundaries, the church has these laws and rules even for us so that we can grow in that love within those boundaries, right? It's sort of like when we're kids and we're given, hopefully, limits on what we can and cannot do as kids. And if we step outside of that, then there's some kind of correction even that needs to take place. If we step outside of those bounds in terms of the moral realm, then it's time to run back to the sacrament of confession. So those boundaries sort of kick us back into play, right? So get back in there. <laughs> so, which is good for us even. We recognize that even as kids, even though we don't like it as kids. And it's the same thing in the world today, even as adults, right? We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, and that includes whoever this God character is, right? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> we should probably back up, right? Okay. So, let's go back to the beginning. We, I talked uh, briefly about these 
last week also. I just sort of mentioned them in terms of objective truth versus subjective. Um, but let's go. With, so moral principles are certain. That means that really and truly good and evil does exist. So that's certain. We can know that there is such a thing as good and evil. And we're, tra we're called, again, even as we live out our freedom, I said this last week time and again, to do the good and avoid doing evil. That's an authentic living into the freedom that God has given to us. Avoid doing evil and choose to do good. And that's sort of the universal norm for us in many ways. Uh, in terms of this moral law also, but what is it what is it that's good and what is it that's evil? And we talked about that last week also in terms of we received that from the commandments, from the beatitudes, from the precepts of the church, and then from other uh, laws that were given through the scriptures. Moral principles are universal. They're true for all times and places and situations. So, Catholic Church, get with it, right? Why are you so far behind the times in the way that the whole, all of the culture is, is moving? Well, because we hold to universal truths, not just something that's true in the here and now or true for me and not true for you, because then there's no truth at all, right? But that truth and moral principles, in this case, also are universal. True for all times and places and situations. There are some things in the moral world that are always good, right? If, if they're done for the right reasons, we'll get to that. And there are some things that are always objectively evil. Objective is the next word. Not arbitrary and subjective, but realistic and objective, factual. So again, it doesn't, it's not just dependent upon one person versus the other and what, how they think of something, but there are objective truths that we can come to. And remember, we talked about this also last year with the philosophers who began to realize, they looked out on the world and they were like, Oh, there are just certain ways in which the world works, right? So there's objective truths that we can come to just by looking out on the world. And we talked about the formation then also of natural law in particular. Moral principles are necessary for salvation. If you do not believe in any moral principles as objectively true and binding, you will probably not believe in sin either. For sin means disobeying real moral laws, which is precisely what's, again, happened even within the Catholic Church, right? People who will have that perspective of saying, well, there's not really any such thing as sin, or I don't have any real need to go to confession, because really what's underlying that in some, one way or another is that they don't believe in sin anymore. The Church says, well, wait a second, no, actually there is sin, and these moral principles that are given to us are to guide us away from sin. So again, what does Jesus say about sin? As we give ourselves over to it, we become enslaved to it. He wants us to be free, to have life and have it to the full. So, there are three moral determinants when we're looking at actions, when we're choosing to do things morally. What makes something a good act or an evil act, right? So the first is the object chosen. We'll get to all of these. The second is the end in view or the intention. And the third is the circumstances of the action. Now, for there to be a morally good act, all three of those things have to be good. If one of them is off, then it's not a morally good act. It can be a morally acceptable act, but it's not necessarily a morally good act. We talked about this uh, recently, also even with uh, the vaccine, right? So receiving the vaccine is a good thing for us because there are certain circumstances that lead in that direction, but it's, not, it's a morally acceptable act, right? 
because of the evil that was used even in producing uh, the vaccine or testing the vaccine. That'll hopefully make, well, hopefully if you watched uh, the video that we shot also on uh, vaccinations, hopefully that already makes sense to you. Uh, but this will hopefully help to clear that up for you if it does not. So the object chosen refers to the object that's chosen by the will, an act that the will chooses to perform, the thing that I choose to do, right? It is a good toward which the will deliberately directs itself. Whether an act of will is good or bad depends on the object chosen by the will. Reason is able to recognize the essential nature of the various objects that be, can be chosen by the will and to judge whether they are good or evil, depending on whether or not they are in conformity with the true good. So again, there has to be an understanding of the objective good, which an objective good we can even look at in terms of the commandments, right? So if my... Uh, Let's see, let's use one of the commandments then. So to steal something, to take something that does not belong to me, that's the object I'm choosing, my will is choosing to steal this thing in a moment. Now, we're not talking about if someone's doing it without choosing or if they do it, like you walk away after you've just signed a piece of paper, right? And you walk away with a pen. Is that a morally evil act? Well, that's not what we're talking about, right? So it's when the will actively is choosing this also. But to steal is always then objectively an evil thing. Huh? So to choose to do that in a moment is not a good act. It would be actually an evil act or to kill someone. Now, we can talk about Oh, and I didn't, uh, we'll have to do another class perhaps later. I didn't, uh, I forgot to add pieces in this class uh, that I was hoping to do. Part of that's because I didn't have the time that I thought I was going to. Uh, but it would have been at the end of our time anyway. So it'll, there's so much to cover today to talk about it later will be good. Um, but it's called the principle of double effect. So, for example, uh, someone you, you kill someone, let's say that someone has killed someone, well, then we have to look at what, is, what was going on in the situation. If someone was defending their life, right, they're not, in the moment, they weren't choosing to literally kill that person that's attacking them, but they were defending their life. So that's, the, that's their choice in that moment, or the act of the will is to defend themselves because this person was going to take their life. And so they're choosing in the moment to save themselves, to save their life. Does that make sense? So their intention also makes a big difference, which we're going to get into more of in a minute. But to even to continue with it, the intention isn't, again, to take this other person's life because... Uh, I don't know, because you hate them or whatever it might be. It's, again, you're desiring to save your own life. So you're choosing in the moment to save your life even by uh, physically impeding someone who's coming at you, whether that's by, yeah, there's all kinds of issues that we could get into there, and I won't open that can of worms. That's where my mind went. But let's get to the intention here. And then the circumstances, sorry, I should talk about that. The circumstances also obviously dictate something there as well. So someone, again, is seeking to defend their own lives. Um, or maybe it's their family's life who's also in the same house with them, right? So they, someone might even choose in a moment, if someone actively seeks to, to kill them, they might even choose to lay down their life as opposed to um, defend their life. But if someone's family is there, they might be more aggressive and saying, not a chance am I letting them take my life because I'm going to make sure that the rest of my family is protected. So the intention. The intention with which a person performs an act is distinct from the object chosen by the will. 
The same act can be performed with a good or a bad intention. The catechism uh, uses, and I don't know if I have this uh, here or not. No, I don't. So the catechism uses this uh, in talking about fasting in particular. So choosing the choice of the will is to fast, but what's the intention behind it? Why are you choosing to fast in, in the moment? And if it's so that, the catechism uses this example, if your intention is to fast because you're wanting to look good in the eyes of other people, then it becomes an evil act, not a good act. So the intention can change the object of the act to something that itself is evil. Does that make sense? So it, our intention can negatively affect an object, an objective good. Our intention can negatively affect that. So again, I'm choosing to fast. That's the choice of the will. But I'm doing it so that other people will see that I'm fasting and think of how great a person I am. So that would be then a bad intention or an evil intention, and so it becomes then an evil act. On the other hand, so a, a bad intention or an evil intention can make an objective, an object, a choice of the will, bad, but an intention can never make an evil object, an evil choice, can never make it good. So, and that's where you get the, the principle. Um, well, it, let's continue because it'll give it to us. A bad intention can make an act bad that in itself can be good, such as giving alms to the poor in order to show off before others, right? So it's giving us another example there. It's not just about fasting, but also if we're giving alms and we're looking around and we're like, Hey, everybody, look at this. I'm about ready to give somebody some money, right? I'm a pretty good guy. Well, we're doing it for the wrong purpose, right? A good intention, however, can never change an act that is intrinsically bad into one that is good. As noted above, it is the nature of the object chosen by the will that determines whether an act is good or bad in itself. A good intention cannot change the nature of the object chosen from bad to good. The end, a good intention, does not justify the means, a bad act. It is never right to do evil that good may come. It's a big problem in our world today. We think that we can just do something evil in order to bring about some greater good, and the church says absolutely not. We cannot do some uh, evil or commit an evil in order to bring about a good. We cannot do that. So, again, and TV is filled with it, right? Every TV show almost is filled with this. Well, let's appeal to this person's sense of what really is doing good. What's your intention about this person can't be choosing to do something evil. Look at how good their intention really is. Look how good-natured this person really is. No, it's still an evil act if it's, a, if it's an object that is evil. The object chosen is evil. So what it is that I'm doing in the moment, if that is evil, it can never become a good. Yeah, we have two examples of that already, right? The circumstances, the third piece, the third of the moral determinants, the circumstances of an act do not change the nature of an act from bad to good or, or vice versa. They can contribute to increasing or diminishing the moral goodness or evil of human acts. So notice it doesn't say that it uh, changes it from a morally good act or a morally evil act, but it's saying that it, uh, let's see, the nature of an act itself, right? So it's not saying that the nature of the act gets shifted, but that it can uh, contribute to increasing or diminishing the moral goodness or evil of, a hum of human acts. Stealing a man's money this is the example, 
is worse when the man is very poor and already has barely enough to eat. Think of King David, right? In the example even that the prophet comes along and says, look, here's this guy, and he has basically nothing. He has this one, I don't remember what the example is or what, the, what it was that the prophet said. Was it sheep? Pet what? Pet lamb. pet lamb. Very good. So I thought it was a sheep. But So pet lamb. So they have one sheep, right? One pet lamb. That's their whole livelihood. And this other person has all the sheep that they could ever imagine having. And that person that has all the sheep goes and steals the sheep of the the person who only has that one and nothing else. What should happen to that man? And David said, that man should be put to death. <laughs> you are that man, the prophet says. Huh? Because David had stolen the, the wife, uh, right? Uh, Bathsheba, he'd stolen Bathsheba. And even had her husband killed in battle, right? Pull back. Let him be struck down because she becomes pregnant with David's child. Not good business. So there's all kinds of bad acts that are in there, objectively evil acts that David is choosing, right? The adultery, the having him killed, um, as well as stealing from then, uh, the man as well. Circumstances can also either diminish or increase one's responsibility for an act. When a person is not feeling well or is in pain, he is not as responsible for losing his temper and saying unkind words as when he is feeling fine and in good health. Now, it doesn't necessarily completely excuse it, right? So if someone is being unkind, it's still an evil, right? If they're choosing that, there's still an evil that's going on there, but the circumstances lessen the level of culpability that's there. Okay. Make sense so far? Okay. If an act is bad, however, this remains unchanged by the circumstances. They can make neither good nor right an action that is evil in itself. That, again, comes from the catechism, right? Uh, I'm probably, if we put this video on YouTube, it might get taken down, I don't know. But <laughs> uh, to refer back again to the uh, vaccine, right? It's morally acceptable to receive the vaccine. It doesn't mean that it's a morally good act. Why? because they used aborted cell lines in the production or the testing of the vaccine, right? So there's a remote enough cooperation in that case with evil, and we'll get to that in a moment with uh, the other chart that you have, uh, and we'll explain it. But there's a remote enough cooperation with that that it's permissible given certain circumstances. Right? So it doesn't mean that it's always permissible, but given certain circumstances, it is, which we'll get to. So again, it's, I want to make that clear. We're, the church is saying that it's a morally acceptable act to receive the vaccine. Right? It's something that even the church has said we should do in order to save others. Right? But it doesn't make it a morally good act necessarily. Make sense, the difference there? If it doesn't now, it will more as we continue to go on. As one of the three elements alone is to make an, is enough to make an act evil, but one alone is not enough to make it good, because for any human work to be good, each and all its essential sources must be good. For instance, a good building can be spoiled by a bad foundation bad walls or bad electrical wiring. In a story, one good feature, for example, a good plot, is not enough to make a good story if the story lacks good characterization or a good theme, right? So it might, think of a movie, right? It might have one good feature that's in it, but the plot line is terrible, the theme is terrible, the characters are all terrible, but 
it has one good thing, and you're like, yeah, that's still a bad movie. <laughs> okay. So with the human act, the object and the intention and the circumstances must all be right. You must, one, do the right thing, two, for the right reason, three, in the right way for it to be a good act. Three common but oversimplified moralities each, each exaggerate one of the three factors and downplay the other two. Legalism stresses the object, objective act itself. Subjectivism stresses the subjective intention. And situational ethics or moral relativism stresses changing situations or circumstances. Okay, other questions so far? Do you, how about this? Let me, asking if there are questions can leave out lots of questions because are there questions that are bouncing around in your mind and you don't know how to formulate them? Yes? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me, at least what it's around. Yes? So, so the, the question is, I can get this at some level right when we're talking about it uh, out here, but when it gets to be applied in the real world um, and decisions are being made rather quickly, how is it that I can, because I'm not necessarily thinking through all of these steps, how is it that I can uh, choose the good in that moment? Well, and I think part of that is, knowing what the good is, so we know, for example, that we're not supposed to lie, right? So the Eighth Commandment is bearing false witness against your neighbor. Now, a der derivative of that is not just bearing false witness against your neighbor, but it's telling lies, right? We're not supposed to tell lies. And in fact, even to bring about a good, we shouldn't tell a lie, right? So when someone, now bear with me, Husbands, you'll like this. Ladies, you might not like, like this so much. But if, if your wife comes to you and says, does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> the guy can't win, right? One way or another. It doesn't, it, it, you could have the perfect answer. and It, it, it might go okay, but it's probably not going to go very well, right? So, but, and I would say from... From the guy's perspective, I would say, look, you should be receiving all of that affirmation from the Lord and not from me. You know how beautiful you are in my eyes, right? So you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't even put me in that kind of a predicament where you're asking me that question in the first place. So, I mean, really, if, if someone asks that question, if a wife asks her husband that question, what is she wanting? She's not, I mean, because the moment that he says, well, honey, you, your hips look a little bigger than that than they might in, in another dress, right? I mean, that's not the reality of what she's really looking for. So he immediately is in trouble. So you're almost putting him in a spot where he has to lie, right? Or just tell you, and it may be the truth, but you're not even going to, how are you going to even know that? Does that make sense? Okay, sorry ladies, sorry guys. <laughs> but it's true, where should your affirmation come from in that sense? It should come from the Lord. Do I look good in this? Well, in the Lord's eyes, I always look good. So should it matter even whether I look good in somebody else's eyes? Not really. I mean, we're still human beings and we struggle with those things, right? But guys, you just got off the hook for all of those questions in the future. So we know already that, that innately, right? Because we've been brought up from the time we were young not to lie. So we know that in the moment already. We really do. 
but we can have all kinds of pressures on us in that case that change the circumstances, our culpability. So guys, right, when your wife asks you that, your culpability is probably lessened because, well, you might not want to sleep on the couch. <laughs> okay. Okay. Makes sense? Does that help a little bit? So it's important for us to have, even in some ways ingrained in us, what truly is good and evil. So, I mean, thou shalt not kill. We know that that's a, a bad one, right? We shouldn't kill people. We know we shouldn't steal. We know we shouldn't commit adultery, right? All of those things we just innately know, and yet someone in a moment might make a bad decision, right? Now, again, the intention that's there makes a difference in some ways. Um, it doesn't necessarily always, it doesn't change the evil that's been done. So, for example, even in the case of self-defense, that someone's coming at you to take your life, and you instead kill that person in order to save yourself or to save your family, when you, they had no right to do what they were doing, right? There's still an evil that's done there. The person's dead, right? So that's not a good thing. That's not what we would desire huh? or shouldn't desire in that moment. Um, but it's not all of a sudden that that's made it into a good thing. Does that make sense? Okay. Your family is safe. You're safe. That's a good thing, right? There's a, an object that's good there, but there's also another part of that that's bad. Okay. Okay. Has that, has, has that helped a little bit? And then the circumstances, of course, always pay into that, also play into that, which we're going to get into especially now. And hopefully, as we get into the different principles of cooperation with evil, that will help to get cleared up a little bit. So if something is a good act and the intention is good and the circumstances are good, it's good, right? Then we don't have to worry about it. It's when... One of those three are bad, and especially if the first two are bad, that the whole thing really gets tainted. The third one might just diminish the goodness that's there. So, again, in the case of the vaccine, right, there's a good act. The person choosing to receive the vaccine is a good thing, right? It's a good act because, or it's a good thing. I shouldn't say it's a good act because there's pieces of that. It could be a good act, right? If the other circumstances wouldn't have been bad. So person getting a vaccine, that's good. They're doing it in order to protect themselves and to protect those around them. Intention's good. So the object's good. The intention's good. Circumstances are what's the issue because again they used the vax or they used aborted cell lines in order to create the vaccine, right? So it becomes a morally acceptable act. It doesn't become a morally good act, but it's also not a moral evil. If it were a moral evil, then we couldn't receive the vaccine. Make sense? Okay. What's that? And. Not receiving the vaccine, if you're, oh, that's a good question. The question was, how about not receiving the vaccine? Uh, yeah, I've got friends who are going to plan to take it, too. So, I, 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 and we've been on a stem and I've had it a long time now. So. Yeah. Um, so, if the person chooses not to take the vaccine, so the object is important there, I suppose, too, right? So the object, it, I'm sure that uh, for most people in that sense, it's because I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't assume, but there's a couple of different reasons that I've heard where people are choosing or for which people are choosing not to receive the vaccine. One is because it came out so quickly and people are afraid of the consequences that, that might be there. So hopefully as the vaccine uh, continues to be administered to people, some of that fear will be waylaid, right? And as time goes on, they might, uh, and obviously it's being tested on human beings, right? So um, in that sense, hopefully that fear gets uh, set aside. Now, I just was, uh, actually I was just talking with uh, 
uh, my neighbor, who uh, happens to be a pharmacist, <laughs> yesterday. And he was saying, for example, that um, I, they know that uh, the AstraZeneca, is it AstraZeneca, right? That vaccine is pending approval, I think, in the United States still. And he was saying that he doesn't even know if they're going to approve it. And he was talking then about um, the, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, and they've chosen not to go with the J Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So he said that they've they'd admitted, administered thousands of vaccines at this point, um, and they've had no serious ramifications from the Pfizer or the Moderna, but the Johnson & Johnson, they said the day that, the one day that they gave out that vaccine, they had 10 cases where people had fairly severe reactions to it, and so they've chosen themselves not to, to give that out. But hopefully that would be, I mean, especially when it comes then to Moderna and Pfizer, that would be, that concern would be waylaid as they see people receiving the vaccine and they're um, not having uh, bad results, right? The other part, though, is participation in any kind of participation in evil. Huh? So if it's weighing on someone's conscience so much that they're saying there's some kind, there's some level of evil that I'm participating in here and I don't want to have any kind of participation in evil, then we need to respect that in a, in a way, right? Because their conscience is also dictating that to them because they're so... Um, animated about the abortion issue, which we all should be, right? Again, if we're talking about objects, the church says that abortion is always an evil, right? An intentional abortion is always an evil. Now, there's a case for a double effect there also, right? Which gets complicated, uh, but again, double effect in a case where, so for example, if a woman becomes uh, pregnant and the baby has embedded itself, the embryo has embedded itself in the fallopian tube, the baby one is not going to survive, but the mother is probably not going to survive either if something real bad happens, right? So in that case, if they go in to remove that section of the fallopian tube, the object is not to kill the baby. The object, right, is to remove this piece of the fallopian tube um, and to, then the intention is to save the life of the mother, right? So by the principle of double effect, they can in that case do that. What, what does not constitute or um, justify or a double effect is not applied in the case where, for example, um, even in the case where someone has been raped or molested and has become pregnant, right, the principle of double effect does not apply that the person then can choose to have an abortion. They're choosing to end the life of the baby, not to save the life of the mother, right? So the intention may be that in some ways good, right, if they're uh, thinking, well, the, the person is not going to have that emotional damage there that they might have had if the baby was born and that it's reminding them of that day after day. Well, one, you don't know how that person is going to respond to it, but again, an intention, a good intention doesn't make an evil act a good act, right? It still is morally moral evil in that case. So, and I know of uh, two people, well, I know more than that, but two people that I've been uh, relatively close with that um, whose mothers were, were raped um, and they chose not to have an abortion. Uh, and they're amazing people, right? Who have been a blessing to their family, in one case, the adopted family. Um, because the mother chose to give the baby up for adoption. The other case, this there, here's a here's this is a brutal case in some ways, right? So of course, if people are watching this online, we're adults here too. But I mean, so the mother of this child was raped by her father, raped by her father, and became pregnant. And in my conversation with this woman, who actually, her daughter was there working with her uh, when I was having this conversation with them. And the mother was saying that she can't imagine 
having aborted that baby because that baby is the apple of her eye. It means everything to her. It's brought tremendous healing in her life. This little girl that became, by the time I met them, uh, they were both adults, right? Um, so, again, people may think that they're doing something for the right reason, but they might not be, right? They might be even doing a greater evil, not just that the act is itself evil in terms of the abortion, but the in intention, if they would have fully understood, right, then the intention would have been something else. Are the circumstances also, huh? Does that make sense? Did I answer the question? I hope so. <laughs> Got onto all kinds of different ones there. So, principles of cooperation with evil. This is from the Catechism. Sin makes men accomplices of one another and causes concupiscence violence and injustice to reign among them. Concupiscence, again, remember, is that natural tendency towards sin. So someone sees someone doing something else, and they might be incited to do something bad, or they see someone doing something bad, they might be incited to do it themselves, right? Because of that concupiscence that we ourselves have, that natural tendency towards sin, it can be increased in that moment. So sin makes men accomplices of one another and causes concupiscence, violence, and injustice to reign among them. Sins give rise to social situations and institutions that are contrary to the divine goodness. Structures of sin are the expression and effect of personal sins. They lead their victims to do evil in their turn. In an analogous sense, they constitute a social sin. So we shouldn't be cooperating uh, intentionally, right, with evil because it just leads to more evil, ultimately. The other piece uh, of, that, now that I'm thinking of that in terms of the vaccine too, the other piece that people have been concerned about is not just the cooperation, even though it's remote cooperation with evil, the other piece that people have been concerned about in the moral realm is giving rise to scandal, right? That people would just have in their minds a diminished sense of the evil um, of abortion, right? So, and which we deal with in our world today, definitely have, we have a diminished sense of the evil of abortion in our world today, but the church says it's an absolute evil, right? So in the, again, in the um, case of, of a vaccine, if people are going to be scandalized by this and they're, that's what they're afraid of, then that might be another reason, I guess, why people are choosing not to. But we'll see again how that's a remote cooperation. Accomplices in evil. We are accomplices, so we've already taken sort of good acts and we've set them aside, right? We're just focusing now on how is it that we might be cooperating in some way with evil, right? So good acts are good acts and that's what we should all do and hopefully that's, in a perfect world, that's all we would do is good acts. But we don't live in a perfect world and it's why we need these moral principles. Also, it's not just about love, love, love because there are some things that are contrary to love. We are accomplices in the evil of another by joining in their evil act in some fashion. In the cases of candidates who support intrinsic evils, we may never formally cooperate in their support of an intrinsic evil, non-negotiables, nor may we lend them immediate material support in that regard. The question of those exceptional occasions when remote material cooperation is possible and under what condition is treated below, as well as under the principle of double effect. So the double effect piece I told you that I uh, forgot to add in there, right? But what is the formal cooperation in the evil act of another? The Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1868, not in the year 1868, right, but in number 1868 or paragraph 1868. Sin is a personal act. Moreover, 
we have responsibility for the sins committed by others when we cooperate in them. Before I go any further, let me uh, stop you for a second. Um, you all have this chart also that I gave to you, so it might be helpful um, to have this chart with you as well. For those of you who are online, there's the chart. Sorry, you can't really see it. Uh, <laughs> but um, you'll be able to see it uh, after we go through this and you'll have all of the things that we're talking about also not just in the chart. So at the at the top of the chart is the principal agent, the one who does the act, that person themselves, right? So there's an evil act and maybe the intention doesn't matter, could have been good or evil. Um, it still would be an evil act as long as the act itself or the object is evil. And then the circumstances around it may be good or bad, but again, the object is, is still evil, so it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so there's the principal agent, the person who chooses to do the act. Then there's the cooperator, the one who assists the evildoer in some way, one way, shape, or form. And we talk about formal cooperation. So formal always for, formal cooperation in an evil act is always going to be also a participation in evil and something that we should never do in terms of uh, being a formal cooperator. Intends the immoral act to occur. So um, I think you can think of, uh, it's the reason why in the law even, people go to rob a bank. That's a morally evil act, right? So doesn't all of the other things don't necessarily matter. But let's say the person, uh, there's the people that are in there robbing the bank. There's also the person who may be driving the getaway car. They're just as responsible as the people who are in there. If, for example, even a, a murder happens in the bank, they kill someone in the bank, the person that's out in the car is still an accomplice to that because they have a formal cooperation, right? They know the risk getting in, huh? Especially if they know that people have guns. If they didn't know they had a gun, that might be material cooperation, but not necessarily formal cooperation. They have formal cooperation in the robbery of the bank, even though they're sitting out in the car, as long as, again, they know that is happening that that's the purpose that they're sitting out in the car, right? And the person that is equally guilty, guilty for that immoral act. So, by participating, I'm going back to your notes, even though, again, I want you to keep that chart because I think it's helpful for you to see that uh, difference. Let's see. So uh, there's a question that I just saw pop up there. Um, is voting for someone associated with supporting the Equality Act considered cooperation with evil since it has such a negative impact on the church and society? We're going to talk about the Equality Act on uh, Saturday. Lots of heavy topics, it seems like, recently. But um, the Equality Act hasn't gone into place necessarily yet or... It, didn't, it hadn't, I think Congress just voted on it, right? Was it the House that just voted on it? Um, and then, uh, and, but it was only a few weeks ago, which was after uh, the fact, right? Um, so in a sense, voting for someone who did vote for the Equality Act would be a participation. We'll see at what level it would be a participation or a cooperation as we move through even, right? But the, the act at that point hadn't happened. So in that particular circumstance, it's not necessarily a cooperation because they didn't vote for them. And then the, uh, and the act had happened before, but it happened after they were voted in. Okay. By participating directly in them. So sin is a personal act. Moreover, we have a responsibility for the sins committed by others when we cooperate in them. One, by participating directly and voluntarily in the act. Two, by ordering, advising, praising, or approving of them, right? By not, three, by not disclosing or not hindering them when we have an obligation to do so and by protecting the evildoers. 
Formal cooperation refers to the agreement in the will regarding the evil act. You may never assist another person in an external, sin, external sinful act and intend its sinfulness without participating formally in that cooperation. Such, such formal cooperation is always sinful, a sin against charity, scandal, as well as the same kind as the act in which one cooperates. For example, to willingly drive someone to get an abortion, to pay for it, encourage it, if it determines their will to do it, defend the doing of it, etc., is gravely sinful, both against charity and against life. So, let's read through that again, right? Because how many, uh, even we hear about in terms of the, the Catholic Church, who will even encourage that, right, or defend the doing of it, right? And there's a formal cooperation that's there in the participation then of abortion. For example, to willingly drive someone to get an abortion, to pay for it, to encourage it if it determines their will to do it, right? So if you're encouraging them, so for example, and in some ways, in this case, even the mother might be more responsible, Responsible mother and father might be more responsible than even the child who has the abortion. So I've heard of cases where the daughter who got pregnant didn't feel like they had an option, right? Mother and father were making them get an abortion. They're driving to it. They're paying for it. They're not just encouraging it. They're leading everything in the direction of that, right? So in some ways, I mean, she should still have control over her body and she can still say no in the moment and then the doctors, there's nothing that they could do, right? But the person felt less uh, free to make that decision. Huh? So the greater responsibility may even lie on the parents in that case, right? Or defend the doing of it is gravely sinful both against charity and against life. Material co cooperation, so on the side of material cooperation, so we have formal cooperation. Let me start again. <laughs> First we have the principal agent, the person who's doing the act. Then we have someone who's cooperating with that. Either they're doing that formally, right? So, or they're doing it materially. So if they're doing it formally, it's always an intrinsically evil thing to cooperate in that sense. Okay, so the person who's formally cooperating with that is doing an evil there. And it says even equally guilty of the immoral act. Now, on the other hand, material cooperation, there's all kinds of different levels, right? So in, on the material side, there's immediate material cooperation, there's immediate material cooperation, there's proximate, and there's remote, okay? Remote is what we were talking about again, right? That's the most removed from an evil act. So remote is down there. We'll get to that. So material cooperation and the evil act of another. Assisting another person in an external sinful act by an action which is not sinful and without approving of the other's sinful act in one's will is material cooperation. Such cooperation may be immediate, necessary to the sinful act, or immediate, secondary to the sinful act. So, I think... I think the example, if I'm remembering this correctly, and I sure hope that I am. Um, so it could be the example of uh, a nurse who works uh, in an abortion clinic, for example, if we're staying with that uh, theme of abortion. Uh, a nurse who works in an abortion clinic caring for uh, the person who has just had the abortion happened to them, right? So the doctor obviously has formal cooperation and even he's the one, he's a principal agent himself in an evil act, not just a formal cooperator, but he's actually performing the abortion. So he is not just a cooperator, but he's also a principal agent. 
the person who's receiving the abortion is also a, a principal agent in that case because they've chosen to, to have the abortion, right? And then there's the formal uh, cooperation, those who have either, again, driven the person to have the abortion, paid for the abortion, encouraged them in a way that determined their will to have the abortion or defending the doing of that abortion. Then a material cooperation, again, would be more of than a nurse who's maybe, maybe even caring for that person afterwards. But again, it, without that nurse present there, the abortion wouldn't be able to happen. If all nurses walked out and said, there's no way we're gonna be helping to care for this person because they've just had an abortion. Now, it's a different thing to be caring for the spiritual needs of the person also, right? So the moment that someone walks out of having an abortion, for example, we should be, as Catholics, as Christians, we should be surrounding them with love and trying to get them the healing that they need in a spiritual sense, to, ask, to be asking for that forgiveness, to recognize that they're human beings, right? So that's not a material participation in that sense. Does that make sense, right? So there's a huge difference there. Okay. I'm trying to think of other circumstances or other um, uh, cases. So uh, this would be a case, material cooperation. Uh, remember I talked about robbery also. So someone goes in to rob a bank, there are risks that are there, right? Now the bank is gonna get robbed, that itself, we've already talked about that's a moral evil. Let's say that someone gets shot then in the bank. Now the person that was sitting out in the getaway car out in the, may not have had the intention in their own will to have someone killed and yet they have a material cooperation with that, right? They don't have the formal cooperation because they're not uh, necessarily in line with having someone be killed. They didn't think that they were getting into this necessarily, although the risk is there for sure. And so there's a material cooperation that's there. Make sense? Is, is this starting to clear up a little bit as we go through some of these examples? Or is it still that sense of, and the, let me ask it this way again, is it still that sense of, I'm confused and I don't know exactly where to begin to ask as to why I'm confused? Not so far, or yes? Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, she was saying that, uh, it's, she was re reminding us even of what Priscilla said earlier and saying she was in agreement with that. So it, it's one thing to be sitting here and listening to this and taking it all in, but we also need to sit back and kind of soak it in also, right, to let it sink in a little bit. Is that... Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, you're talking about formal cooperation and uh, paying for an abor abortion, and he said, then, uh, what about our tax dollars? So tax dollars would be more of a remote. Uh, participation um, because it was never in our intention whatsoever, right, that our tax dollars would be used for that. And as long as we're voting against, again, our tax dollars being used for that, then we have very little or remote cooperation with that, right? Um, and because there are so many other which we'll get to, can we pause that one for right now? Because, but make sure that you bring it up when we get to remote participation. Okay, please, don't forget. Okay, good. 
He said he won't, so, and then left. So just letting people online know what's going on. Okay. So then we have either material from material. It's broken down even further, right? All of this is under material cooperation. We have either immediate material cooperation or immediate material cooperation. So immediate is this. Any direct close cooperation in the sinful act of another, while claiming not to embrace the evil intention, is tantamount to formal cooperation. For example, lending the money for an abortion out of a motive of friendship is inseparable from, from the abortion. So you still have an immediate cooperation with that person. Right, because you're even though you're just you're not directly paying for the abortion, but you're lending the money to the person who's going to then use that money for the abortion. It may not be that you're embracing the evil intention that's there, and yet it's uh, it's saying even tantamount to formal cooperation. There may be some rare exceptions in matters of justice in situations where one can presume consent. For example, to save someone's life under a threat of violence, one could destroy property. While presuming a reasonable owner would not want property saved at the cost of a life. But such cases are exceptional, since they involve relative goods, property versus an absolute good, life. Right? Okay. So they're presuming consent of the person who has their property destroyed, right? This person obviously is going to be okay with this because they would rather have a life saved than have their property destroyed. Make sense? So the person who has their property destroyed doesn't have any participation in that evil, right? They just own the property. The property happens to be destroyed. That's an evil itself, right? Uh, but the person who is, uh, have, is destroying the property is using some form of the property in order to save their life. Not, they're not seeking to destroy the property itself. Okay. Let's see. Sorry, I'm looking to see. I see there's more comments that are here. So, Many Catholics were fully aware of Biden's views on abortion and beliefs that abortion is okay up to birth, yet voted for him. That is going, that is going to allow many babies to be killed during the next four years' cooperation. It is a cooperation. Um, I'm not, I'd have to sit down, to be honest, and uh, think about or and analyze each of the ones um, because they know his track record there, I suppose, right? Which it's a cooperation uh, in evil. And I don't know, again, I'd need to sit down and think about which uh, cooperation that would be. Um, but I think the other part of that is that people are uh, also thinking they're voting for Biden because there are other evils than that they're not participating in. Again, even... The USCCB has said that that's the preeminent issue, the issue of abortion and life. But in someone else's mind, they may be saying, they may be weighing these things out and saying, well, I don't want to participate in the evil of this other candidate either. And so that's where it gets stickier, right? But again, the, the bishops did say that that's the preeminent issue for us. Okay. Immediate material cooperation is generally sinful. So, immediate material. So again, we have principal agent, we have a cooperator in evil, we have either formal cooperation, which is always an equally evil, and we have material cooperation, which may be more immediate, or it may be more immediate, or even proximate or remote, right? So, Immediate, uh, providing the material not necessary for the immoral act to occur. They may be guilty of the immoral act. Cooperation in the sinful act of another by an act that is secondary and subservient to the sinful act, neither sharing in the deed or the evil intention, may either 
may be either proximate or remote from the evil act. So that from mediate, you have to break it down further and determine is it proximate cooperation or is it remote cooperation? At this point, we don't know, right? So it's got to be broken down even further, which is what's happening really at the level of material also. So is it immediate material? Is it immediate material? Then if it's immediate material, is it proximate material or uh, proximate cooperation, sorry, not material, proximate cooperation or remote cooperation. So we have to break it down further. Now we're going to proximate. Proximate, immediate, material cooperation is always sinful as it leads to and is necessary for the sinful act to occur. For example, to provide nursing care for, okay, so I was wrong earlier and I jumped the gun there. Um, so the immediate cooperation or immediate, uh, is that what I said? The immediate material cooperation I said was um, a pre or post operative uh, the nurse helping in that pre or post operative care for someone who has, who's had an abortion. They're saying, uh, sorry, that I was wrong there. So it's not immediate, it's proximate, right? I need to look up what would be more of an example of an immediate uh, cooperation. Okay, so proximate, immediate, there we go, sorry. For example, to provide nursing care pre or post operatively in an abortion clinic for an abortion. It is not an abortion, but it makes one possible, right? Which this would also be the case if, for example, and we highlighted this also in the case of the vaccine, right? So in the case of the vaccine, <clears throat> if the aborted cell line that they were using was not reproducing itself, which in the case of uh, the cell lines that they used in testing the vaccine and producing the vaccine, they are producing themselves or reproducing themselves, replicating is the word that they use, replicating themselves, right? But if that was not the case, if someone were, uh, if they used, for example, a cell line that was not replicating itself, and it would immediately cause a need even for more abortions to happen so that they can take the cells from that uh, aborted baby, then that would be also considered proximate cooperation with evil, right? So it would heighten the evil in, in terms of things if, if a vaccine were created that way. It was not created that way. So they're being created uh, or tested from a replicating aborted cell line so it's a different case. Does that make sense? Okay. So we would have more participation in evil if it was proximate. It's not. And then in that case, they would be guilty of the immoral act if we then in that case were to receive something like that. If it caused again, more abortions to happen as a result. Remote, immediate, material cooperation is sinful except under certain conditions. Cooperation in the sinful act of another by material support which is remote, that is, not intimately connected to the evil act, is sinful. However, under certain conditions, it can be tolerated. So it's morally acceptable and, they're saying, not sinful always if certain conditions apply, right? So here are the conditions that must apply. The act by which cooperation is, rend is rendered is not itself sinful. It has two effects. The good, is, the good one is chosen, the bad one is tolerated. So again, thinking of, in terms of the vaccination, there's a good that's being chosen there in terms of even um, the vaccine itself is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. And then the intention also, of course, is to protect the self and the other, so there's still a good that's there. The bad that's tolerated is that there was a cell line, aborted cell line, that was used in order to either test or to produce or to, uh, 
uh, oh, for crying out loud, I'm forgetting all of the language, sorry. I'll step forward. You get the same sense in the word produce, but there's another word in there. Number two, there is a proportionately serious reason to justify tolerating, tolerating the evil of another. So in this case, the reason or the proportionately serious reason is you look at out on the world the hundreds of thousands of people who have died as a result of the virus, right? And so we're saving the lives even of perhaps hundreds of thousands of people more by receiving in that in this case uh, the vaccine. So it's more, it's proportionately serious reason to receive in this case uh, the vaccine, right? Now, it's important here that we don't confuse uh, proportionate in this case with what we call proportionalism, which is absolutely wrong from the perspective of the church. So proportionalism says that if the intention is good enough and outdoes the evil act or the object that's chosen, then it's okay to do, right? In other words, they're saying in some circumstances, it's okay if you have a good intention, it's okay and even a good to do an evil. And the church says, absolutely not. If it's a, if it's a good intention, but there's an evil act, it's still evil. But there are people even within the church and even some moral theologians within the church who tried to argue that proportionalism should be allowed, right? The church has said no. So that we should not confuse these two things, right? We're talking about a proportionate serious reason, but that's way down here in the remote level, not in the intention level or the act level. We're talking about in the circumstances. Number three, the danger of scandal is avoided by protest, explanation, or so, some other means. This is why I've said time and again, right, that the bishops have said that we can uh, receive the vaccine as long as there is a protest, an explanation that we're given, or some other good thing that we're doing, right? So otherwise, it gives rise to scandal. Look, Catholics are participating in, and that's the way that the media sells it, right? Which is why it's so important for us to counteract what the media is saying. The media is saying, look, the church has said that it's okay to receive a vaccine that's created from aborted cells. No, that's not what the church has said. It's saying that it's, it's morally acceptable because the, great, the circumstances that are there. The church is not condoning in any way, shape, or form abortion. An important distinction that's there. But we do have an obligation to avoid scandal, right? So that's why, again, we, we even gave people, we said, here's a letter. <laughs> We're trying to make this as easy as possible for you. The church has said we need to protest in some fashion this. Here's an easy way for you to do it. Just sign the letter and, and send it in to that company that's made it or whatever. Or making sure that each person that knows that you received the vaccine, that you're giving an explanation to every one of those people also, right, as to why it's morally acceptable in this case to receive the vaccine. So which one's easier, I suppose, for you to do, to explain to every single person that knows that you received the vaccine all of this and why it's okay to receive it, why it's a, a good, uh, a morally acceptable thing to receive it or to write a letter in terms of that protest also. Make sense? Okay. It's complicated stuff in some ways. And it, I mean, even introducing it, to say that we're, you're going to understand all of this now, it's, a, it's not a reasonable thing even to expect you to know that, but at least it begins to give you some things to say, I need to understand this better myself. So I take on the, the deeper study of this as well. I mean, there's a lot for us uh, to go through here and it's already eight o'clock almost. We have five minutes. So 
I added a, a piece on uh, mutilation there because of things that have come up recently also. Um, but again, we can recognize, again, what are the, what determines in, in a sense, uh, I just am realizing, if you people are in line back there for confession, the confession line is actually over here. So you might want to jump over there before anybody else comes in. Uh, what was I saying? <laughs> mutilation um, but there is a reason oh so in terms of determining right whether something is in the the object level is a good or an evil again all that we have to do is look at the law of love which is what I read in the first com in the reading at the beginning too right you will remain in my love if you keep my commandments the Lord says to us so we seek to follow the commandments to follow also the beatitudes and um, as well as, as the precepts that the church has given to us. Ooh, that reminds me of one thing, which I said last week, and I need to make a little bit of a correction with regards to precepts of the church. So I said last week, in regards to the precepts of the church, there are the five precepts that the church gives to us. And I said, look, this is one way that you can identify that someone is a practicing Catholic if they're following the five precepts. I should say, if they're seeking to follow the five precepts of the church, right, then they're a practicing Catholic. Huh? So a Catholic who is saying, I could care less about the precepts of the church, about the commandments and following them, right, going to mass on Sunday, which is also one of the precepts of the church, if they're saying, yeah, I could care less about that, then we wouldn't necessarily say that they're a practicing Catholic. Now, all of us fall short in some ways, right? So, again, those five precepts, uh, attending Mass on Sunday, let's see if I can get them off the top of my head here without having reviewed them again. Uh, attending Mass on Sundays, which is obviously uh, always a holy day of obligation, going to the sacrament of confession, so confessing our sins at least uh, once a year, um, fasting and abstaining on uh, at least uh, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, um, da, 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 uh, attending Sunday or attending Holy Days of Obligation also, and what am I missing? Oh, thank you. Receiving the Eucharist at least once a year in the Easter season. So. And then added on to the last one, actually, and I was talking about this with a priest. I always thought, uh, for many years, I had thought that the um, fifth precept of the church was to provide for the material needs of the church. It's listed under the fifth precept of the church in the catechism, but it's not the fifth precept. So we have also uh, one of the precepts is providing for our part of one of the precepts is providing for the material needs of the church, right? So if we're at least shooting for that, seeking to do that in our lives, then we're a practicing Catholic huh? and seeking to follow the commandments of the Lord too. Again, we're always going to fall short in some ways. But the whole point of even what reminded me of that was the precepts. So again, if we want to see is something uh, in the object of the will, a choice that we're making, if it's good or evil, look at the commandments, look at the Beatitudes, look at the precepts of the church and the other laws of the church that God has given to us also, right? And then we can understand if something is uh, a moral good or a moral evil in terms of in the object, the choice that we're making. So abortion falls into, which we've talked about the majority of, in terms of the examples, because it's such a prominent one also. Um, it's thou shalt not kill, right? So we believe that that's a human being. Science tells us that that's a human being, even from the moment of conception. It's not going to be an antelope. That's a human being, right? Okay. So mutilation, I think, also falls under the thou shalt not kill at a certain level, right? So here's the definition. An action which deprives oneself or another of a bodily organ 
for its use. We have bodily organs, right? All of us have bodily organs, a liver and a stomach and a brain and all of these things, right? Okay, so if we deprive someone, ourselves or someone else of a bodily organ or its use, the mutilation may be either direct or indirect. Direct mutilation is a deliberately intended act that of its very nature can cause mutilation. So if you're trying to mutilate someone, right? Or uh, if the effect is not directly intended, it is called indirect mutilation. Mutilation belongs to the category of murder, which is what I said, thou shalt not kill. The difference is that mutilation is partial destruction, whereas murder is the total destruction of a person's physical life. Moral law is concerned with mutilation because no one has absolute dominion over the body. And the violation of this principle is an offense against God's sovereignty. No, it's a different thing. You're helping the life of another, and it's not necessarily going, it's not going to kill you, right? So the, the question was, that wouldn't apply to the donation of a kidney, and the answer is no, unless it would kill you. If it would directly result in you dying, then that would be another matter that we would have to go into, right? And then there's, then that could enter into the principle of double effect there. Maybe that's it. I was just thinking through that as you asked the question. Maybe that's because of the principle of double effect even, right? So we have more than one kidney, and so, yeah, anyway. Okay. Nevertheless, a person, so we don't have absolute sovereignty. So even if, and this is a, a case that people will make for abortion, right? My body, my choice. Well, not exactly, because we don't have absolute dominion over the body, right? So even if you believe that the baby, which has not just your DNA, but it has another person's DNA, so it's not just your, your body, right? But even if we believe that that's the case, that it's my body, a part of my body, and so I can remove it if I want, that's not the case because we don't have absolute dominion over our body. But it's also not the case in, in the sense of uh, abortion, that it's just my body, it's actually a completely different body that's within your body. Nevertheless, a person has the right to sacrifice one or more members of the body for well-being of the whole body. So if your kidney is diseased also, right, then you can remove that kidney. And even other things like, I mean, you don't have another appendix. You can have an appendix removed if it's about to burst, right? or if there's fear that it's going to burst in the future as well, or, um, I don't know, a gallbladder, right? There are different things that you can do. You don't absolutely need a gallbladder. So if a gallbladder is wreaking havoc on your body and it's causing all kinds of illness, then you can also have the gallbladder removed, right? Thus, it is permitted to amputate any organ of the body in order to save one's life. However, lesser reasons than danger of death also justify, or can justify, is really what they're saying also, mutilation. The removal or suppressing function, or wait, sorry, the removal or suppressing the function of any organ of reproduction is in a, in a moral category of its own. It is never permitted when the purpose is directly to prevent conception or pregnancy. So... The removal of another might be another uh, reason to remove an organ might be to, again, save the, the life of another, right? But we can't just do it because we feel like we need to, which and I know that it's a sensitive subject out there, but in terms of transgender, you can't just reassign sex having a surgery Right, because there's a mutilation even of the body that's happening there, that we don't have a right over absolute dominion over the body to be able to choose that in that moment. Make sense? Okay. So, 
we get back to the note from the USCCB, which I read uh, at the beginning, and I think it uh, might be even good for us to prayerfully listen to it once again, right? Our culture, culture frequently exalts individual autonomy against community and tradition. This can lead to a suspicion of rules and norms that come from a tradition. This can also be a cause of healthy criticism of a legalism that can arise from concentrating on rules and norms. So there are always circumstances that are there also, right? Advocates of Christian morality can sometimes lapse into a legalism that leads to an unproductive moralizing. There is no doubt that love has to be the essential foundation of the moral life, but just as essential in this earthly realm are rules and laws that show how love may be applied in real life. So we need not just love, but rules and laws. In heaven, love alone will suffice. In this world, we need moral guidance from the commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes, right? And all that follows the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount is from chapter 5 to chapter 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. The precepts of the church and other rules to see how love works. Love alone, set adrift from moral direction, can easily descend into sentimentality that puts us at the mercy of our feelings. Popular entertainment romanticizes love and tends to omit the difficult demands of the moral order. In our permissive culture, love is sometimes so romanticized that it is separated from sacrifice. Because of this, tough moral choices cannot be faced by the individual, right? The absence of sacrificial love dooms the possibility of an authentic moral life. But there is such a thing as sacrificial love. Scripturally and the Logically, the Christian moral life begins with a loving relationship with God, a covenant love made possible by the sacrifice of Christ. The commandments and other moral rules are given to us as ways of protecting the values that foster love of God and others. They provide us with the ways to express love, sometimes by forbidding whatever contradicts love. The moral life requires grace. All of this requires grace, right? The Catechism speaks of this in terms of life in Christ and the inner presence of the Holy Spirit, actively enlightening our moral compass and supplying the spiritual strength to do the right thing. The grace that comes to us from Christ in the, in the Spirit is, an essential, is as essential as love and rules. In fact, makes love and keeping the rules possible. before I actually close with a prayer. Uh, there's a couple of things um, that I'm realizing that I didn't uh, get into this tonight um, that are in my notes, but they're underneath this. Conscience is one. So what role does conscience play in all of this, right? So we have to obey a certain conscience, but we also need to recognize that if we have an erroneous conscience, that is, if we've formed our conscience in a way that is contrary to God's law, then we have a responsibility of seeking to correct that erroneous conscience and allow it to be formed properly. That's our responsibility. We can get into conscience uh, at another time, but conscience is not uh, the dictator of what is good and evil, right? It is with it can be in some ways within ourselves. Again, if we have a certain conscience that in a particular situation we have to choose this and we have no other choice, then we need to follow our conscience. But then we also, after that moment has passed, we need to, and this can get back to some of the things that you're talking about also, Priscilla, we have to then, after that moment, to sit back and say, okay, now this is what my conscience told me. What does the church say about this? And where is it that I've missed forming my conscience properly according to what the church teaches, right? So we constantly have to check in against what the church is giving to us, what the scriptures are giving to us. We can't, we, it's, while it's true and people have sort of beaten this point home sometimes, you have to follow even an erroneous conscience that's true if your conscience is certain about it, even if it's erroneous, but you're also still called to form your conscience and to continue seeking to form your conscience in accord with God's law and the church's law. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So often people, what they do is they just dismiss reforming their conscience and just say, well, I don't care. I think this is what's right and I'm going to do it because I'm certain that that's right. Well, not exactly. And then the other thing uh, is the principle of double effect, which we talked about a little bit, but we didn't go into great detail about it. And I have people obviously waiting in line for a confession, which begins at 8.30. So, um, okay. Yes. Oh, please, I'm sorry. Yeah, I asked you to do it and then I forgot. So the question, uh, the, uh, well, first the statement, I suppose. We know that uh, Planned Parenthood commits hundreds of thousands of abortions, that Planned Parenthood receives millions of dollars uh, from uh, the government. Is, am I, uh, what's the, what was the word? Am, right. Am I c compelled or uh, morally responsible in some way? to withhold some of my taxes then so that they are not paying for abortions. So we first would go back even, I think, to what Jesus says, pay unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what belongs to God, right? So does God need money? Not necessarily, but or there, then we go to, there's some cooperation at least in that. So, but we can't necessarily, unfortunately, we can't control whether the fact, whether or not, um, Planned Parenthood receives government dollars necessarily from our taxes. What we can in some ways in terms of the way that we vote also, right, which is why, again, the church says that the preeminent uh, concern there is around life and around abortion, right? So um, the participation in that, again, would be a remote participation in terms of paying taxes to the government, even though they're supporting that. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the government is going to support abortions. They, in more recent years, have begun to do that, right? If you're looking for the line for confession, it starts over there. <laughs> there are people still coming in. Okay. Um, we don't know that they're necessarily going to do that, number one, uh, but we have a responsibility to try and vote in politicians who are not going to uh, encourage that or vote for things like that, right? Because that makes them actually, it's them who would have that proximate or even immediate uh, cooperation, material cooperation with evil, right? So politicians who vote for that would have that more uh, immediate material cooperation or proximate material cooperation. We, uh, as people who pay taxes, have a remote cooperation with that, right? So, um, and because there's so many other good things that the government does, right, it gives, it goes into again, as we look at remote, so it has to have three different things. The act by which cooperation is rendered is not itself sinful, so paying taxes itself, not sinful, because Jesus even tells us to pay unto Caesar what is Caesar. That is, it has two effects. The good one is chosen, the bad one is tolerated. So there's good that's being done with those taxes. People are being uh, afforded all kinds of health care or education or funding that they might not else otherwise have, right? Giving to the poor and all kinds of things. The bad one in this case would be tolerated. There is a proportionately serious reason to justify tolerating the evil of another. So again, if we look at all of the good that's done through those tax dollars, it's, it in some ways doesn't mean that it's not a cooperation, right? In some ways we're still remotely cooperating with evil. We're still cooperating with evil is just in a remote enough manner and there's enough other good that's done that it uh, overwhelms the evil that's done there. And then the, the danger of scandal is avoided 
by protest, explanation, or some other means. So if we're uh, protesting that our dollars would be used for abortion, which obviously we do in the church in a, with a loud voice, I think, um, or we're explaining this is how, why I'm still paying tax dollars even though they're going to, to fund an abortion or some other means. So we're fulfilling those three criteria there that still allows us to be able to, to pay taxes. Yeah, pro so yes, voting for someone who is for life, right? But also um, it would be, um, yes, participating in the protests, so writing legislators who may not be for life, right? So we have a responsibility to do that. Every year when, of course, we gather at the March for Life at Olympia, we encourage people to go in and, and speak with uh, their representatives, right? And so that's a, a part of that, protesting in that way, obviously doing it in a peaceful way, right? So, yep, yes. Are the what? Oh, are the handouts from last week available? I don't, I don't have them here. I think, was I supposed to bring the, an extra one? And I forgot. Uh, you can find them on our Facebook page. We, I took pictures of the handouts there, so they're on the Facebook page. Um, but I don't have any with me, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I could, um, I can try to remember. I, I can't promise that I will remember, but I'll try to remember to bring copies for this weekend also. And, okay, there you go. She'll help you get the picture of them. Yeah, very good. Okay. Oh, there's all kinds of comments that I missed. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry guys. Uh, yeah, I, my, the big question Irene says here, that my big question is, where do we find pro-life candidates? They're hard to find. It's true, especially when we talk about, or I mean, we talk about uh, life is bigger than just abortion versus not abortion, right? There's all kinds of issues that are that are out there also. Um, so uh, pro-life candidates in and of themselves might be rare enough, um, but we need to find them also. Yeah. Okay. I hope that I haven't created more confusion, but at the same time, if I have created more confusion, what's your moral responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> to form your conscience, to go out and educate ourselves, right? So we need to be, this is, it's not something that we should just let slip away, but we need to be spending the time studying these things so that we're understanding them better and better also, which includes myself, right? Okay, so I will try quickly for those online, I'll take a picture of all of these, uh, hand or all of the pages of this handout, including the chart that I gave, and uh, I'll post them on Facebook for all of you, but let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. The gift, to, first even and foremost, of the life that you have given to us, and the sacredness with which we should seek to receive that gift. We ask you, Lord, to help us to recognize the gifts that you have given to us, the gift of our intellect, that we can come to a place where we can understand how nature is meant to work through natural law, even, even as the early philosophers did. We thank you for the ability to use our reason, this gift of our intellect that you have given to us, also to make choices, ultimately, that you desire even for those choices to be made for the good, that we may do good and avoid evil. We thank you also for the grace that you give to us to do precisely that, to do the good and to avoid evil. We ask you to help us, Lord, in any attachment that we may have to sin or any erroneous conscience that we may have, that 
with the help of your grace, we may overcome that to have that conscience formed in accordance with uh, your law that has been given to us and the teachings of the church, which your Holy Spirit guides and protects into all truth. Give us a deeper understanding of the teachings of your church that we may grow deeper in love with that same church even as we do understand them. That we may, may grow also deeper in love with you, Lord, as we recognize again your goodness and the ways in which you bring good even out of the midst of evil. Help us to do likewise, to choose always the good, to grow in our moral life as we seek to follow you, to grow in our love as we seek to follow you and love not only you and ourselves, but also our neighbor. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, that's very kind. I love it when people do the little hearts and the little thumbs up and there's lots of them flying up. That makes me feel good. That's very nice of you. Yeah. Have a blessed night, you guys. I'm going to shut off the video for you guys online there also. Thank you. Yeah.